Hello, everyone. Welcome to the June edition of the All Bugs Good and Bad webinar series. Uh, we're here today for a webinar on arthropod-borne diseases affecting humans. Uh, should be a very informative uh, presentation today. And our, our speaker is Dr. Nathan burkett Cadena. Dr. Uh, burkett Cadena received his master's and Ph.D. from Auburn University's War Eagle. Department of Entomology and Nematology, focusing on ecology of vectors of West Nile virus and Eastern equine encephalitis in the southern United States. He completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of South Florida, developing novel tools for surveillance of river blindness in Africa and Mexico. Dr. Burkett Katina joined the faculty at the Florida Medical Entomology Laboratory of the University of Florida in October 2013. His book, Mosquitoes of the Southeastern United States, was released in March of 2013. Dr. Burkett Kadena has co-authored more than 30 scientific articles. So we are, we are in for a treat today uh, with this webinar. And um, you know, I'd like to thank Dr. Burkett Kadena for being here with us today. And I will uh, turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, like Chris said, I am a Auburn grad, and so War Eagle as well. I wish I could get that back from everybody in the audience, but I'll just have to settle for a um, virtual War Eagle, I guess. So this is my first time presenting um, via the internet, so I'm excited to do so, and I thank everybody for joining me today. So we got a lot to cover, so let's jump straight into it. So my topic today is arthropod-borne diseases affecting humans. And like Chris said, I am currently at the Florida Medical Entomology Laboratory, which is part of the University of Florida system. So before we talk about arthropod-borne diseases, we've got to find out what exactly is an arthropod. So an arthropod is any invertebrate that has a segmented body, jointed limbs, and an exoskeleton. So this includes insects, arachnids, crustaceans, and myriapods. So insects, our first group, are arthropods having the body divided into three parts. That's the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. They have three pairs of legs and usually two pairs of wings. Now I think that most kindergartners could probably tell me these things, but um, as I get a little more in depth with the other groups of arthropods, you might find this little refresher useful. So a lot of these uh, organisms you see in this uh, array of photos are familiar uh, insects. So grasshoppers are insects, or so fleas cockroaches, bed bugs are insects. A lot of people think that they could be a type of mite or a tick or other arachnid, but bed bugs are, in fact, flightless insects. Arachnids, one of the other most well-recognized group of arthropods. An arachnid is an arthropod having the body divided into two parts called the prosoma and the opistosoma. They have four pairs of legs and they have no antennae. So here you'll see familiar and maybe unfamiliar arachnids. Spiders and ticks and scorpions are probably the best recognized arachnids, but mites, pseudoscorpions, and odd things called whip spiders, which are native to the tropical regions of the world, are also arachnids. Most arachnids are either predators or herbivores or parasites. Crustaceans is another uh, great and tasty group of arthropods. Uh, some of our favorite small uh, meaty items are crustaceans, so shrimp, crab, and lobsters are crustaceans, but then there are also other things that fit the category of crustaceans that uh, may be a surprise to you. So roly-polies are crustaceans, barnacles are crustaceans, and there are even some very odd parasitic crustaceans. The one in the lower right photo actually eats the tongue of a fish and lives in the fish's mouth as a parasite inside the mouth. So crustaceans are quite variable. They usually have the body divided into two or three parts, but they can have many different uh, numbers of legs. They can have um, a minimum of 10 legs, but up to 20 pairs of legs, and they have two pairs of antennae. The last group of uh, arthropods that I'm going to mention, um, although there are many, many types, are myriapods. Myriapods have two familiar groups. These are the centipedes and the millipedes. So myriapods are arthropods having multiple repeating body segments, um, a minimum of about 10 segments up to more than um, 75 segments. They have uh, variable numbers of legs and only a single pair of antennae. 
So centipedes are notable because they actually can bite. Some of their mouth parts are modified uh, as venomous piercing organs. And so they are predators. They feed on, feed on smaller arthropods, and they can bite people and inflict a painful wound. Millipedes, on the other hand, are for the most part harmless, although some millipedes do have a sort of poison they can excrete if they're um, handled or eaten. So don't go eating millipedes, please. Don't, if you see them, just leave them alone. They're not hurting you. And please don't eat them. Okay, so we're here to talk about arthropods and arthropod-borne diseases, though, not just all the crustaceans and myriapods that are out there in the world. And so what I put on this slide are three different arthropods and the diseases they are known to transmit. And these are probably some that are familiar to just about everyone. So mosquitoes uh, in the top are known to transmit West Nile virus. Ticks are known to transmit Lyme disease. And fleas transmit plague. So in my opinion, this brings up a, a logical question. Why don't ticks transmit plague? For that matter, why don't mosquitoes transmit plague? And why don't fleas transmit West Nile virus? So this is actually a really important in qu question when we talk about arthropods and arthropod-borne diseases. It gets to this idea of a vector. So a vector is any agent, that would be the mosquito in this case, that carries or transmits an infectious parasite from one organism into another living organism. So this word vector is going to be used a lot today, so uh, we really need to have a firm understanding of, of that word. So what makes a vector a vector? There are more than 3,500 species of mosquitoes in the world, and not all of them are transmitting West Nile virus or transmitting malaria. So of all the different variety of mosquitoes and the variety of ticks or fleas, why do only some of them transmit a particular pathogen? The reason is related to some very specific physiological and biological processes that happen in the bodies of these vectors. So here we have a longitudinal section through a female mosquito. So we got a female mosquito on the bottom and uh, imagine cutting that female from her antennae to her tail down the middle, looking inside, and this is what we would see. So the head, the thorax, and the abdomen of this female mosquito. Now I'm gonna highlight the internal alimentary canal of this mosquito. So this is the mosquito's gut in its entirety. So we'll start with the esophagus, highlighted here in red. We have the mid-gut, highlighted here in blue. We have the salivary glands, highlighted here in yellow. So these are the components of the mosquito's digestive system that interact with the pathogen. So let's run through a, uh, a hypothetical scenario to talk about why some mosquitoes could be a good vector while others might not be. So we have some viral particles uh, represented by the little red and blue circles. Right? The mosquito, when it drinks the blood of an infected animal, it was going to ingest some of those viral particles. Those particles are going to pass through the esophagus, the salivary glands, and into the midgut. Now, when that mosquito feeds again, it doesn't just regurgitate. If it's going to infect another, an, an animal by feeding, those viral particles have to make it out of the midgut, into the body, and back into the salivary glands. So first, they have to pass through the body wall of the midgut out into the body cavity of that mosquito. And they have to have a mechanism, a molecular mechanism, that uh, adapts them for this specific uh, passage. Next, they have to, to replicate inside the mosquito's body. The mosquito has an immune system, just like humans and other animals, that's going to try and fight off the infection. So that means that this virus has to be adapted to survive and replicate in the mosquito's body. Those viral particles are going to have to cross a tissue barrier and make it back into the salivary glands of that mosquito so that the next time that mos mosquito feeds, those viral particles can be injected along with the saliva into another host. So these are lots of physiological ba barriers that prevent most mosquito species from transmitting a particular uh, virus or other, other pathogen. So we're going to start looking at the different arthropods and the diseases they transmit. 
And I, I put this slide together just to show you the diversity, the visual and biological diversity of the blood feeding arthropods that we encounter and those that can transmit different pathogens. Uh, so we have mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, noceums, mites, bed bugs, deer flies, sand flies, which you're probably familiar with if you've been to the Middle East. So these are not the same things that we call noceums in the South. Um, a very different group of organisms that feed on blood. Black flies, which are mainly found in mountainous areas, tsetse flies, which are found in Africa, and kissing bugs, so-called for their habit of biting people on the face as though they're kissing them. Uh, so I'm going to start with mosquitoes and mosquito-borne diseases. Just this is Mosquitoes are the most important group of blood-feeding arthropods on the planet because of the diversity and number of pathogens that they can trans transmit. So they can transmit uh, filarial nematodes. Uh, so in humans, it's called fil filariasis. Um, dog heartworm is a type of uh, nematode worm that's transmitted by mosquitoes also. They transmit protozoa, so small microscopic almost animals uh, like malaria. And then there are a large diversity of viruses that mosquitoes can transmit. So dengue fever, yellow fever, St. Louis encephalitis, eastern equine encephalitis, western West Nile, Rift Valley fever, chikungunya virus, Everglades virus, on young, young fever, and the list goes on and on, and there's many more. So the ones that I have listed here are just a few of those which can cause disease in humans. Mosquitoes can transmit many, many other viruses to non-human animals, and even viruses that could replicate in your body but not cause any disease. Ticks are the second most medically important arthropod. So ticks, there are more than 900 tick species worldwide, and ticks actually transmit a lot of bacterial pathogens. You'll notice that uh, mosquitoes do not really transmit bacterial pathogens. They were viruses and protozoa and nematodes, but uh, ticks are adapted to transmitting um, bacterial pathogens. So these include some of the more famous uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, tularemia and Lyme disease, and several others that you may have not heard of. Uh, they can also transmit a malaria-like pathogen called babesiosis. And there are some viruses that trick ticks transmit, such as tick-borne encephalitis, Colorado tick fever, and uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, some great names for some deadly pathogens. And I'm just going to quickly run through a few of the other uh, pathogens um, before we get into some specifics. So, uh, black flies transmit uh, filarial worm, uh, which causes onchocerciasis. Lice can transmit epidemic typhus and trench fever. Fleas transmit epidemic typhus and plague. Kissing bugs transmit Chagas disease. Mites with Q fever and Tsutsu gamushi disease. Deer flies can transmit tularemia. Uh, tsetse and muscoid flies transmit African sleeping sickness and yaws. And sand flies transmit leishmaniasis and bartonellosis. So for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to talk about specific arthropod-borne diseases. I'm going to try and hit a diversity of diseases, so related to their pathogens and the arthropods that transmit them, and just cover a few of those in, in detail. I could probably give a two-day-long presentation in detail on all of these different pathogens, but I'm just going to highlight a few of these here to show you the diversity of what's out there. So um, why is this important? So why do we care about arthropods and arthropod-borne diseases? Well, this, this map summarizes probably the most important reason. So this map shows uh, the number of human deaths which occur each year due to arthropod-borne diseases. Um, so in the Americas, about 16,000 deaths per year mostly attributed to a tropical disease called Chagas disease. And we're going to talk about that uh, towards the end of this, specifically towards the end of this whole presentation. Moving eastward in Africa, there are more than 1 million deaths per year. And most of these deaths are caused by malaria. 63,000 deaths in eastern Mediterranean region, again, caused by malaria. And then when you get into eastern Asia and the Pacific, we, you see deaths caused by malaria, but also dengue, caused by encephalitis, and caused by leishmaniasis, which is caused by those sand flies. So mortality is not the only way, of course, of measuring the impact of an arthropod-borne disease. 
So this map shows daily disability adjusted life years. So this is the amount of life lost um, for being infected with a specific parasite, the number of years that people as a whole lose in a specific region. So in the Americas, we see that Chagas disease is still a major, major factor. And malaria, again, in Europe, the Mediterranean, and Africa. But then we start to see that other diseases, like lymphatic filariasis, which barely registered in the previous slide, is now a major, major contribution of uh, these disability-adjusted life years in Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific. So an immense human burden uh, based on the infection with these uh, arthropod-borne diseases. So now I'm going to start talking about specific diseases and, and talking about um, the, the symptoms, the transmission, and the burden of these diseases around the world. And I'm going to start with uh, uh, viral diseases. So viruses are very simple organisms. No one can even tell us if viruses are actually alive. They're replicating segments of DNA or RNA inside a protein coat. They have no heartbeat. They have no pulse. <laughs> it's, it's impossible to tell whether these things are alive, but we really don't consider them as part of the tree of life. So dengue, yellow fever, and chikungunya are three mosquito-borne diseases that are caused by viruses. And these uh, viruses also have something else in common. They're transmitted by the same mosquitoes. So Aedes aegypti, which is the yellow fever mosquito on the left here, and Aedes albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito, uh, pictured on the right. So these mosquitoes are native to Africa and Asia, respectively, and they have been introduced throughout many, many parts of the world, and they currently occur uh, throughout many parts of the southeastern United States. Um, so here is, um, let's, let's show a brief uh, schematic of transmission of uh, dengue virus. So here we have a human being who's infected with the virus, represented by these little yellowish circles. So a mosquito serves as the vector, and as a mosquito bites the human being, it takes up the virus and then later transmits the virus to another human being. When that human being is fed upon by another mosquito and uh, that mosquito transmits to another human being, we complete the transmission cycle. So this transmission cycle on, involves only mosquitoes, humans, and the virus. This is the least complex or the most basic transmission cycle of an arthropod-borne pathogen. So let's talk about dengue first. Dengue viruses, so this is not one disease. So dengue is, is a, uh, a group of closely related but distinct single-stranded RNA viruses belonging to the genus Flavivirus transmitted by certain Aedes mosquitoes and that caused debilitating disease. So right now we know of five different types of dengue. They're called, um, creatively enough, dengue 1, dengue 2, dengue 3, dengue 4, and dengue 5. Now this distinction about the different forms of dengue is very important because if you're infected with more than one type of dengue, you get more severe disease than if you're just infected with a single type of dengue. So this map shows co-circulation of multiple dengue serotypes for the previous decade. So the redder the number, the redder the map, the more dengue serotypes, up to four dengue serotypes that are circulating in the same area. That means the people that live in those areas have a much greater probability of getting severe disease from dengue. And the severe forms of dengue are uh, breakbone fever, which includes headache, uh, fever, muscle and joint pains, and a characteristic skin rash. This is, this is typical of a single, uh, of infection with a single type of dengue virus. Now, if you're infected with multiple types of dengue virus, you can develop dengue hemorrhagic fever. So this is much more serious than simple dengue, and the symptoms include enlarged liver, low blood pressure, red eyes, swollen glands, a weak rapid pulse, and bleeding from the eyes, nose, and mouth. Demi dengue hemorrhagic fever can result even in death. D 
dengue shock syndrome is, a, is another dangerous complication with dengue infection re resulting from multiple serotypes, and it's associated with very high mortality. Uh, increased vascular permeability together with the uh, myocardial dysfunction, that's uh, heart dysfunction, and dehydration contribute to development of a shock syndrome. And this results in multiple organ failure. So the onset of this disease in dengue can be dramatic and its progression relentless. Very fast progression from uh, infection to mortality. So dengue has not um, uh, been recognized for a, a really long time. It was, it was dengue disease was really first noted in the 1940s and 50s in Japan and India and with isolated outbreaks of, of the disease. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, it spread to other locations in Southeast Asia, although um, did not spread outside of Asia. By the 1970s, dengue had emerged in the Caribbean, in the Americas, in uh, Paraguay, and in, in West Africa. By the 1980s, dengue was found uh, even in the United States. Dengue uh, epidemics in Texas, and dengue continued to spread elsewhere. In the 1990s, uh, uh, we had fought back the dengue infestations in Texas, but dengue continued to surge in the Americas, Australia, and Africa. Today, we see that dengue is found throughout uh, the tropical Americas, much of Africa, much of Asia, and uh, Southeast Asia. So with that, I'm going to move on to yellow fever. Uh, yellow fever, again, is a viral disease, and the majority of persons infected with yellow fever have no illness or only mild illness. Um, but in the persons who develop symptoms, the incubation period is, is typically three to, day, three to six days, and the initial symptoms include sudden onset of fever, chills, severe headache, back pain, general body aches, nausea and vomiting, fatigue, and weakness. So most, most people will even improve after this initial presentation. But after a brief remission of hours to a day, roughly 15% of cases progress to develop a more severe form of the disease. The severe form is characterized by high fever, jaundice, bleeding, and eventually shock and failure of multiple organs, culminating in death. This is very similar to the progression that we see with dengue virus. So the transmission cycle of yellow fever is a bit more complicated than that for than what we sho showed for simple dengue. So there are sylvatic elements to the transmission cycle, and these involve primates. So wild monkeys living in the forest can be infected with yellow fever, and mosquitoes um, of the genus Aedes or Haemagogus that feed on these monkeys transmit the virus from one infected monkey to an uninfected monkey, maintaining the cycle of transmission in the forest. So this is often called jungle yellow fever. Now these mosquitoes can also bite humans that come into the forest for hunting or for gathering fruits. And when those humans return to the city and the urban mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti, feed upon that person, they can initiate the cycle of urban yellow fever. So then these urban mosquitoes feeding upon people transmit the virus from, from person to person. So yellow fever um, was a mysterious disease prior to uh, the, the previous century. So people in uh, any warm climates lived in fear of yellow fever. They had no clue that mosquitoes were vectors of this disease. So this uh, series of um, paintings shows the sequence of a yellow fever progression in a human from a healthy man going to, to feverish, progressing to jaundice with bleeding from the nostril, finally culminating in the black vomit, which was characteristic of yellow fever sufferers. I want to mention quickly Dr. Josiah Knott of the uh, 19th century. Um, he was a, a resident of Mobile, Alabama, and Dr. Josiah and I was a physician who treated many yellow fever patients in the Mobile, Alabama region, and uh, he is credited for being one of the first people to hypothesize uh, that mosquitoes are involved in the transmission of yellow fever. So 
uh, one of his papers, so here's the title, um, Yellow Fever Contrasted with Bilious Fever, Reasons for Believing in a Disease Sui Generis, Its Mode of Propagation, Remote Cause, Probable Insect of Animalcular Origin. So this was a, a real turning point in, uh, in physicians and scientists' viewpoint of uh, infectious disease. So this was before germ theory, before we understood that bacteria and viruses could even cause diseases. He had proposed that there was similarities between uh, the way the virus was spreading from person to person and uh, the way that mosquitoes were moving throughout the environment. So uh, another um, historical context that I would like to mention is the Yellow Fever Commission. This is the U.S. Army Yellow Fever Commission, which occurred in Havana, Cuba, in 1900 and 1901. This is uh, one of the most important events in the history of um, arthropod-borne diseases when it was discovered and proven that mosquitoes could transmit a virus, and the virus was yellow fever. The members of this yellow fever commission were Major Walter Reed, uh, physician Jesse Lazier, physician uh, Aristides, Aristides Agramonte, uh, James Carroll from the U.S., uh, Carlos Finlay, who is a, a physician in Cuba, and William Crawford Gorgas, another connection to the state of Alabama. William Crawford Gorgas was raised in Mobile, Alabama, and uh, was an observer on this Yellow Fever Commission. I know it's hard to make out, but this schematic shows a building um, where they did their yellow fever tests. So they had humans, so volunteers, with big quotes around that, um, soldiers who were infected with yellow fever, and put in screened huts. Mosquitoes were allowed to feed on them, then those mosquitoes were transferred into huts with healthy humans, and they were able to establish that these mosquitoes could carry the virus from uh, infected to uninfected persons. And this was an incredible turning point in the history of uh, treating arthropod-borne diseases. So with, with that knowledge that mosquitoes transmitted diseases, uh, the governments of the American countries, all the way from the United States down to Argentina, banded together to try and eradicate Aedes aegypti, the mosquito that transmits this virus. So their cam campaign was focused on the vector, not on treating people. So they focused on eliminating this vector. And so this is the range of this mosquito in the 1930s. Now by the 1970s, immense efforts in South America, Mexico, and Central America had basically eliminated this mosquito from most of those parts of the continent. However, you see that the picture in the United States barely changed. So the United States did not hold up their part of this bargain, and it was realized that we were not going to eliminate this mosquito from the Americas. So by the year 2002, this mosquito had returned to reclaim all of the area that is lost to these eradication efforts. Now today, um, yellow fever causes about 200 cases each year, resulting in around 30,000 deaths. To put that into perspective, dengue uh, infections are estimated between 50 and 100 million each year worldwide. So yellow fever is, uh, although it's much more deadly, a uh, far smaller concern. And the reason is the yellow fever vaccine. So the yellow fever vaccine is uh, freely available to most people around the world. If you're traveling to a yellow fever endemic country, you're required to get a yellow fever vaccine. It is safe, it is effective, and it's one of the best vaccines in the world. So we have this vaccine to thank for the current state of uh, yellow fever. Um, I'm going to briefly go over chikungunya virus. So chikungunya virus is, um, is uh, related to... Uh, yellow fever. Uh, most people with chikungunya develop some symptoms beginning three to seven days after infection. The most common symptoms are fever and joint pain, but other symptoms may include headache, muscle pain, or rash. In some people, the joint pain may persist even for months. Chikungunya virus disease does not often result in death, but the symptoms can be severe and disabling. People at risk for more Severe disease include newborns, infected around the time of birth, older adults, and people with medical conditions. Once a person has been infected with chikungunya virus, he or she is likely to be protected from future infections. 
So once your body has developed antibodies to chikungunya virus through exposure, you're probably not going to have uh, another infection from this virus. Uh, so this um, document from the Pan-American Health Organization shows uh, a lot of the, the symptoms of uh, chikungunya virus. So severe arthritis in the joints, and this can result in a, basically a doubling over in pain. In fact, the name chikungunya means uh, contorted with pain, uh, vomiting, headache, uh, conjunctivitis, muscle pains, and diffuse pain of the spine are, are really common symptoms of chikungunya virus. So the transmission cycle of chikungunya virus is, is not as clearly documented as that for yellow fever and for dengue virus. Primates are involved, but we don't know to what extent. So primates can be infected with chicken, chikungunya virus, and it's very likely that certain Aedes mosquitoes can transmit this virus from primates to humans. We do know that Aedes albopictus is the primary vector of this virus from human to human. So where did chikungunya virus come from? Uh, it's actually a native of Eastern Africa. So uh, in the 1950s and 60s, this virus spread to India and Southeast Asia. Then later, in this century, uh, the virus had another exodus from Eastern Africa, and this was a different strain of the virus as depicted by the different color, again found in uh, India, but also in islands of the Indian Ocean. Sorry, having some technical difficulties. My slides are not advancing. All right. Oh, Chris, can you see if you can advance the slide? Wow. Nathan, what slide do you need to be on? Uh, let's see. I don't see a slide number here. Are the slides numbered? No. Would you tell me what the title is on the slide? It says Chikungunya, and it's a map. That's what we're seeing. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> there are multiple slides with the map of chikungunya, and it's not advancing on my computer. Right. The current slide has maps on it with arrows that, okay. that go um, through 2014. All right. I'll start there then. So, wh so what happened then is the virus spread from uh, Southeast Asia all the way over to the Caribbean. So this occurred in 2013. And then in 2014, the virus spread from the Caribbean into Central and South America and even into Florida. Okay. So I'm going to show a map of the incidence of dengue, yellow fever, and chikungunya. But the map I have here is just human population density around the world. So you can see where the human populations are concentrated, represented by uh, the red shading. Now, if we put countries where dengue has been reported, we see that it it's doesn't match up exactly with the human population centers, meaning there's something else shaping uh, the distribution of dengue virus. Now, if we put these uh, lines on the map which correspond to um, uh, the areas that where freezing, hard winter freezes do not occur, we can, this is where the vector Aedes aegypti is found. And you see that the countries where dengue has been reported is confined to that same area. So that means that the virus is limited by where the vector is found. If we add areas at risk to yellow fever, they fall within that same uh, latitudinal area. 
Now, when we add chikungunya, you can see that most fall within that area, but we also have disease in France and Italy, which falls outside that area. And the reason is that this virus is adapted to Aedes albopictus, which is a mosquito which can withstand much colder winter temperatures than Aedes aegypti can. I'm going to move on now to talking about malaria. Malaria, uh, the name comes from the word, a translation of bad air, uh, which is reminiscent of uh, this idea um, that these, these diseases were not caused by specific things, bacteria or viruses, but they were more like magic in the minds of people before the age of uh, modern medicine. So malaria is a disease caused by infection with plasmodium species, protozoan parasites. There are a number of malaria diseases which can cause disease in humans, but only really five of these are, have been given common names. Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax are the two most common. So if we look at a map of Plasmodium falciparum distribution, we see it's mostly found in the tropical regions of the world. Plasmodium vivax is also found mainly in the tropics. And most people would consider uh, malaria a tropical disease. So the symptoms of malaria include headache, fever, shivering, joint pain, vomiting, and bloody urine. Uh, malarial paroxysm is a cyclical two or three day uh, occurrence of sudden coldness followed by shivering and fever and sweating. Uh, enlarged spleen and enlarged liver are, are other symptoms. So like uh, dengue, um, malaria is, is, a, is a disease of humans and the mosquito. So we, we do not have wild animals involved in this uh, transmission cycle with the exception of Plasmodium nolsi. So this species of Plasmodium was discovered um, within the last decade in Southeast Asia. And it was found that, that people who entered areas of the forest where specific primates lived and were bitten by certain mosquitoes were developing a type of malaria which was different from the other four types of human malaria that were commonly seen. So uh, malaria is a, is a disease that is also a catch-all um, and is transmitted by a lot of different Anopheles species. Anopheles darlingi, Superpictus arabiensis, Fonestus gambii, uh, Culofaceae, Stevensi, Fluviatilis, Ferrauti, Coliensis, Punctulatus, Dyrus, and Minimus. So these are just a few of the major vectors of malaria around the world. But you can see by these color codings that there are a lot of mosquitoes, Anopheles mosquitoes, which transmit malaria the world over. This map from the 1870s shows the distribution of malaria cases in the United States. So ma malaria was once common in the United States. So the darker reds show greater prevalence of the disease. And malaria was eradicated in the U.S. Um, through, some, through treatment and isolation of infected people and basically by putting uh, screening on the windows. Uh, this map shows uh, malaria elimination around the world. So the darkest colors shows places where malaria still persists, and the lighter colors correspond to years or decades when malaria was eliminated from those areas. So we can see that malaria was eliminated from most of North America and Northern Europe and Australia, but malaria persists in many parts of the world today. Uh, back to viruses. Um, I'm going to mention West Nile virus here as this uh, is probably expected, and many people are quite interested in West Nile virus because of its, uh, the toll it takes on humans in the United States. So this is an encephalitis-causing virus originally from Eastern Africa that has been spread around the globe. It causes uh, two specific types of disease, West Nile fever, which is an influenza-like illness, and West Nile neuroinvasive disease. This is acute meningitis or encephalitis resulting in paralysis, a disorder of movement, long recovery period, and prolonged uh, depression. So if we look at the average annual incidence of West Nile virus neuroinvasive disease reported to CDC, we see that uh, few, few children are infected, few teenagers, and uh, as you increase in age, your likelihood of getting the neuroinvasive disease form of West Nile virus increases dramatically. If we look at the uh, disease cases 
reported to CDC by the week of onset, so this is timing of the year, we can see that there is an, an incredible uh, peak in the months of July, August, and September with basically no transmission um, of West Nile virus to humans outside that period. And this is related in large part to the life cycle of this virus. So the virus is transmitted by Culex mosquitoes, and I only have birds and mosquitoes on here because this virus is mainly a disease of birds. It is, it is only incidentally a disease of humans. So mosquitoes transmit to birds, birds to mosquitoes, and humans are incidentally infected, although this virus can cause debilitating disease in people. Uh, like chikungunya, West Nile virus is from Eastern Africa. And in 1937, it was only known from West Nile province in Western Uganda. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, several outbreaks of West Nile virus occurred in Europe and Southern Africa. And it was noted that this, these outbreaks occurred among major flyways of birds, so migratory birds, which are traveling between Europe and Africa during the summer and winter. And then in 1999, famously, West Nile virus was carried to uh, the United States by way of New York. So this map shows the progression of the virus from 1999 to 2004. And you can see that by 2004, West Nile was found in basically every state. Today, we see that West Nile virus is, con is still transmitted in the U.S. and mainly in three epicenters. Uh, there's a western epicenter, um, a central U.S. corridor epicenter, and then one in the southeastern United States, southeastern Arkansas, Mississippi, and um, Louisiana. And although uh, transmission does occur in almost every state each year. We're going to move on to bacteria. So I'm going to talk about two bacteria at once. These are plague and tularemia. So this is Yersinia pestis and Francisella tularensis. Both are gram-negative. Uh, bacteria. Uh, plague is named after Alexander Yersin, uh, a French physician, and plague, uh, or I'm sorry, tularemia is named after Tulare County in California, where disease in humans was first observed. So tularemia can cause these ugly necrotic lesions uh, when the bacteria is introduced into the flesh, so uh, reminiscent of gangrenous infections. Plague, uh, this, this illustrated by bubonic plague, also causes these uh, gangrene and necrotic flesh. And uh, the name bubonic plague comes from the buboes, these um, festering sores in the lymph nodes, which typically occur in the upper thigh. Going back to tularemia, we see that the, the cases of tularemia in, in the United States have been on the decrease um, since the 1950s, although there, is, there are still tularemia cases each year in the United States. Uh, plague cases show a very cyclical pattern. Um, so uh, there have been epidemics in, in living memory in Asia. And today, most of the, the epidemics of plague actually occur in Africa. In the United States, the human plague cases are extremely variable, but there have been peaks of activity every five years or so in the U.S. The transmission cycle of tularemia involves uh, rodents and lagomorphs and can include, uh, vectors include deer fly and ticks. On the right here, you see uh, ticks engorged on the rear of the ear and face of a, of a rabbit and uh, tularemia is also called deer fly fever or rabbit fever. Humans are, can be infected by handling wildlife or from bites from the vector. However, human-to-human -human transmission of this bacterium is not known. This is contrast with plague. So plague transmission involves uh, rodents and uh, oriental rat flea. Humans can be infected from either but human-to-human -human transmission of plague is documented and is actually the most uh, virulent form of the, the plague bacterium. So the human-to-human -human, uh, transmission of plague can result in pneumonic, a lung infection of plague, or septicemic plague, where plague actually enters the blood. And this results in death 
in 99% of cases, so an extremely deadly and dangerous form of a plague infection. Of course, plague is recognized as a pathogen that has shaped human history and art and culture um, since recorded time. Uh, here's uh, an image, a stained glass window of, of human suffering from plague in the 15th century. Uh, the plagues of Europe and Asia have been well documented, including the plague of Justini Justinian with 50 million deaths. There's the Black Death of Europe with an estimated 75 to 200 million deaths. And the Black Death of, of France in the 13 and 1400s. And then the, the third pandemic plague with an estimated 20 million deaths in the late 19, 1800s, all the way up until the year of 1960. So this image shows Asian plague victims in the 1910 uh, outbreak in China. So today, plague is mainly found in certain uh, locations around the world, including the US, South America, Africa, and Asia. In the U.S., the cases are concentrated mainly in the western portions of the country, in the Four Corners region, also in California. Tularemia is found mainly in the northern hemisphere, so uh, the U.S. and uh, northern Asia and Europe. In the U.S., the tularemia cases are mainly concentrated in the central heartland of the country, so Oklahoma, Kansas, Arkansas, and Missouri have the greatest number of tularemia cases each year. All right, we're going to move on to Lyme disease. Uh, Lyme disease is a disease caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. This is a group of bacteria called spirochetes, and these are tiny motile bacteria which m move in the fashion of a corkscrew. This, is, uh, this disease was first recognized in Old Lyme, Connecticut uh, from cases of rheumatoid arthritis in children. Uh, the disease cycle involves um, ticks, and uh, the reservoirs are actually small mammals, so rodents like the white-footed mouse serve as a reservoir. So ticks in the nymphal stage pick up this uh, pathogen, this bacterium, and can transmit it to humans in the next stage, in their adult stage. Uh, so the genus Ixodes uh, are the vectors of Lyme disease, and the major players in this are Ixodes scapularis, Ixodes pacificus, Ixodes persulcatus, and Ixodes ricinus in Europe. So this, show, this map shows the distribution of these different vectors uh, around the world. In the US, Ixodes scapularis in the east and Ixodes pacificus in the west are our major vectors. The major reservoirs, the small mammals that uh, serve as hosts for this pathogen are uh, the western gray squirrel, the eastern chipmunk, white-footed mouse, bank vole, and the common shrew. And this map shows the distributions of each of those around the world. The characteristic um, symptom of Lyme disease infection is a bullseye rash at the bite site. This is also called erythema migrans. This is the uh, physical manifestation of these bacterium moving throughout your skin as they uh, infect your body. Disease, uh, symptoms of Lyme disease include fatigue, chills, fever, headache, muscle and joint aches, and swollen lymph nodes. Uh, another symptom which occurs in a small minority of cases is Bell's palsy. This is a partial paralysis of the face. So you can see in these images on the right, uh, the normal looking healthy human on the right and the resulting Bell's palsy from uh, Lyme disease infection. There are 30,000 cases reported each year in the US and these cases are probably grossly underestimated. Uh, although Lyme disease is treatable with antibiotics, it often goes untreated, and the cases are rarely fatal. Um, human disease in the U.S. peaks in the months of June and July. Spatially, Lyme disease is focused in two parts of the country. So there's Old Lyme, Connecticut. Uh, well, there's the, the northeastern U.S., and then there's also the Wisconsin and Minnesota uh, regions of transmission. Uh, the number of cases of Lyme disease has been on the rise since it was first diagnosed in 1990. So uh, Lyme disease is definitely something to be aware of. 
and the number of cases are, are definitely increasing. I'm going to move on to our second to last disease. This is Chagas disease, also known as American trypanosomiasis. This is an incurable disease caused by the protozoan Trypanosoma cruzi and is spread by blood feeding insects of the subfamily Triatomini. So, this disease is named in honor of uh, Carlos Justiniano Ribeiro Chagas, who was the uh, physician, Brazilian physician who discovered this parasite. So, this parasite is transmitted by these kissing bugs. And here you see a kissing bug feeding on human blood. And to the right, uh, on the skin, is the bug's feces. And this is a critical um, part of the transmission cycle of this parasite. So although the kissing bugs um, are blood feeders, there are other members of the Regiviidae of this family which are not blood feeders. And I thought it, this being all, bugs all good and bad, is pretty important to mention that. So many of these are, are predators of your garden pests. So don't just go killing the Regiviids, please. So the ones that we care about from a Chagas disease perspective are in the genera Rodneus, Triatoma, and Panstrongylus. Infection with Chagas disease results in enlarged spleen, liver, or glands. Um, Romagna's sign results when these bugs bite you at the eye and you become infected at the eye. Enlargement of the heart leading to heart failure and enlarged esophagus or colon, any of which can lead to death. So this is a potentially fatal infection. The transmission cycle of Chagas disease is very different from any of the pathogens we've mentioned so far today, though. So there are wild animal hosts, and the Chagas parasites living inside these hosts um, are in the blood, circulating blood of these animals. The Chagas disease kissing bug uptakes the parasites in a blood meal. Then later, the Chagas parasite will feed upon a typically a sleeping human host. So when it feeds upon this host, it will defecate on the skin, as we saw in the previous photo. Now, these parasites do not come out in saliva. They're actually in the infected feces. And then as you scratch or rub the bite site while you're sleeping, you'll transfer them into your mouth or into the bite site, infecting yourself in this way. So the, the wild reservoir hosts for this include a possum, armadillo, uh, agouti, uh, many rodents, and then even humans, dogs or cats can serve as a reservoir for this parasite. In the U.S., or I'm sorry, in the Americas, this parasite is found throughout much of Brazil, Central America, and even Mexico. So the, the risk factors for this disease usually include houses with very poor sanitary conditions. I'm, in the interest of time, I won't go through all of these, but these are mainly squalid conditions. So this is what these conditions look like. So houses that have very poor um, thing. In the U.S., we have uh, lots of vectors. Um, and so it raises the question, why don't we have this disease in the U.S.? Well, the truth is that we do. We have the reservoirs. And we've had cases of this disease in the last 10 years in Texas, Louisiana, Tennessee, and California. And the common denominator of infection is houses said to be in poor condition. So this pathogen does exist in the U.S. and uh, it does is transmitted to people. So the last parasite I'm going to uh, discuss very quickly is river blindness. So this is a disease caused by infection with a filarial nematode and transmitted by the bite of a black fly. The black flies, unlike uh, mosquitoes, develop in flowing water. So here we see the worms, the adult and, and larval worms of, of the river blindness parasite. And they caught the migration of these worms throughout your body can cause blindness. So this is a very typical scenario in places with river blindness where you have children leading the blind adults with sticks. This is a very sad and debilitating disease. It can also cause uh, dermatitis. The transmission cycle involves flies biting humans with the parasite, ingesting larvae of the worms. The worms develop inside the black fly, insist in the muscles. Uh, they travel to the head of the fly. Mm -hmm. 
right. I think I've lost my ability to advance again. Okay, well, uh, not going backward. Basically, the transmission cycle of river blindness is very similar, where the, the flies will bite again uh, as humans uh, develop a higher, a larger and larger worm burden. Uh, this debilitating blindness can develop. Uh, so river blindness is is treatable. So uh, pharmaceutical companies have have given uh, have have donated free medicine to at risk populations for um, for decades now in the attempt to try to eliminate this uh, parasite from the face of the earth. So uh, this is the original distribution of river blindness around the world. And after two decades of elimination, river blindness has been eliminated from certain sites in uh, the Americas, uh, but very little has, has actually been progressed in Africa and other parts of the world. And so in summary, I'm just going to stop there. Insect-borne diseases affecting humans are, are very diverse. The pathogen can be a virus, a bacterium, protozoan, or nematode. And the vectors include a wide variety of blood-feeding insects and arachnids. Wild animals are important, serving as hosts and reservoirs for a parasite or pathogen. And understanding the biology of transmission is the first step to an effective intervention. All right. I want to thank you very much for listening to me talk about something I'm very passionate about, um, uh, War Eagle. Hey everyone, this is Jeannie from Iowa State. It looks like our um, one of our moderators has been disconnected. Um, Kathy, are you still with us? Okay, I think at, at this point we want to make sure that you go ahead and um, take the survey. That's the link that is listed on this slide. Oh, someone's joined us back. Sorry, we're back, Chris. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Burkett Kadena, for a fabulous webinar. Um, please join us in August for our next webinar. We're skipping July due to the 4th. Um, August topic will be Japanese beetles and other white grubs with Dr. Chong. Um, at this time, we'd love to answer, answer some additional questions, if there are any, uh, through the chat box. And again, please take a little bit of time to click on that link below to, uh, to take a little bit further survey for, uh, for our programming needs. So thanks a lot. Uh, and don't forget to do the four pop-up questions as well. We did already pop up the questions while you guys were gone, but I will go ahead and put them back up for you. Thank you. Sorry about that disconnect there. So, yes, they had already um, answered those questions. Excellent. Thank you. And if there's, there's no other questions, we will uh, we'll adjourn. All right. Seeing no other questions. Oh, I think there's one coming through. Thank <laughs> you.
This looks like we have someone with some um, uh, another phone line coming through. So we're going to go ahead and mute and go ahead and click on the link and we'll end the webinar.